December 1972. After nearly a decade of fighting in Vietnam, American forces decided to make one final push for victory. For 11 days and nights, U.S. Navy and Air Force bombers, led by the venerable B-52, flew around-the-clock missions, raining over 15,000 tons of bombs onto North Vietnam. The operation, known as Linebacker 2, brought the communist war machine to its knees. The men and machines of Linebacker 2 didn't just fly bombing missions. They ultimately flew America out of the Vietnam War. For four years, the U.S. Air Force and Navy pummeled the North Vietnamese in an intense but limited bombing campaign known as Rolling Thunder. The goal, to stop weapons and supplies flowing from the North to the communist Viet Cong guerrillas in the South and to send a clear message to their North Vietnamese sponsors. For three years, pilots of fighter bombers like the Air Force F-105 Thunder Chief and the Navy's workhorse, the A-4 Skyhawk, constantly bombarded a heavily defended North Vietnam. Air crews routinely braved one of the most formidable anti-aircraft defense networks ever amassed, while at the same time operating under the most restrictive rules of engagement in history. The list of Binos was at least 10 times longer than the, than the B-sums, okay? There'll be none of this, there'll be no of that, there'll be none of this, there'll be none of that. We couldn't fly over Hanoi. If you went in, you could only fly certain routes. Um, it was asinine. You know, you'd fly by and, and they're unloading boats in Haiphong and you'd say, oh well, okay, we'll dodge those later. The list of things you couldn't do was enormous. The restrictions only made U.S. missions more dangerous. While American airmen were able to evade North Vietnamese air defenses, they were hardly making a dent in the men and material going to support the Viet Cong. Bombing restrictions might have been scoring points in the political arena, but it was ultimately costing America and its allies victory on the battlefield. Rolling Thunder is a hell of a good idea. It just never was applied rationally. We'd start it, we'd stop it, we'd start it, we'd stop it. Every time it looked like we were doing some good, then we'd go into another bombing halt so you could repair everything we'd hit. Uh, and there was no continuity. You know, we didn't take out all the bridges in one area. We didn't take out all the anything in one area. We'd jump over and hit that, jump over and hit that, jump over and hit that. Finally, with negative reports dribbling in from the front, President Lyndon Johnson decided to halt bombing operations above the 19th parallel. Rolling Thunder was over. U.S. forces began a steady withdrawal from bases in South Vietnam and Thailand. The Air Force withdrew more than 400 aircraft, while the Navy reduced its number of carriers offshore by half. The situation was grim. The ground war in South Vietnam was heating up. Hundreds of U.S. airmen shot down during Rolling Thunder were being held as prisoners of war in various North Vietnamese compounds. Many of the downed pilots were from B-52 crews. In an unprecedented move, B-52s, the lumbering bomber, had become the plane of choice for close air support of ground troops throughout Rolling Thunder. Meanwhile, 
Smaller, lighter bombers, typically better suited for the low-altitude ground bombing missions, flew defensive missions against the North Vietnamese. The switch in roles was unusual for U.S. troops in Southeast Asia. Many questioned the decision. Ultimately, though, the B-52's firepower went unmatched against the rather primitive defenses of the Viet Cong. The controversial decision to use the giant bomber won some support when many ground troops credited it with saving their lives. A big strategic bomber for close air support is surprising, but that's how we used the airplane in those days. Um, we're talking about uh, dropping bombs within hundreds of meters of, of friendly forces, and uh, it worked. Until 1971, the air war targeted the main corridor for supplies flowing to communist forces in South Vietnam. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not one road, but a network of paths, streams, and trails that ran 1,500 miles through the mountains between Laos and South Vietnam. It was the lifeline for communist forces in South Vietnam, delivering over 60 tons of supplies daily. In around-the-clock missions, U.S. forces dropped more bombs on the trail than were dropped during the entire Second World War. Sadly, with little effect. Finally, bombing was called off, giving the North Vietnamese further opportunity to increase their strength. Early on, the North Vietnamese weren't much of a threat. Their air defenses were limited to 36 MiG-17s, about 1,500 anti-aircraft guns. Within just a few years, the situation had changed dramatically. The North Vietnamese Air Force was equipped with nearly 250 MiGs, many of which were MiG-21s, the Soviet Union's latest fighter. Also, they had developed an extensive and well-coordinated ground-based defense network. Their new defenses included hundreds of radar-controlled anti-aircraft guns and SA-2s, Soviet surface-to-air missiles that could travel at Mach 3 up to 60,000 feet. Now it was clear that North Vietnamese forces were becoming steadily more aggressive moving its forces further into southern North Vietnam and Laos. To stop the offensive, the United States built a noose of air assets throughout the region. The Navy positioned planes and pilots everywhere. Carrier fleets were reinforced. Hundreds of Air Force F-4 Phantoms and B-52s, plus additional support aircraft, were positioned at bases in South Vietnam, Thailand, and Guam. Despite ongoing peace talks between Hanoi and Washington, on March 29, 1972, North Vietnamese forces mounted a large-scale ground invasion into South Vietnam. The invasion caught the unsupported and poorly prepared South Vietnamese forces completely off guard. In response, President Richard Nixon launched Operation Freedom Train, a massive bombing campaign against southern North Vietnam in an attempt to halt the flow of men and supplies heading southward. By early May, an angered President Nixon called on the full force of U.S. air power expanding Freedom Train into an unrestricted attack on targets throughout all of North Vietnam. The first linebacker campaign had begun. Unlike Rolling Thunder, during linebacker, the Nixon administration allowed military commanders the freedom to throw around the full weight of their forces. Rules of engagement were relaxed. Pilots no longer needed permission to hit targets that had previously been considered politically sensitive. 
The primary weapons of the new campaign were also dramatically different than those employed during Rolling Thunder. One of the most significant changes was the addition of laser-guided smart bombs. They were carried by fighter bombers like the F-4 Phantom and big bombers like the B-52. That is where the laser-guided weapons had the greatest impact. The extraordinary accuracy of the new bombs and the B-52's internal targeting system allowed strike forces to accurately hit sites that were close to religious buildings, civilian areas, and POW compounds. Strike forces bombed oil and fuel storage sites, air bases, seaports, communications lines, and rail yards, targets that they had been waiting and wanting to strike for years. The intensity of the American bombing campaign forced North Vietnam back to the negotiating table. On October 8th, North Vietnam accepted nearly all U.S. proposals for peace. By late October, it appeared imminent that a peace accord would be signed in Paris. On October 27, 1972, a bombing halt was once again placed on targets above the 20th parallel, ending the first linebacker campaign. As had happened in the past, the North Vietnamese interpreted the bombing halt as a sign of weakness and took the opportunity to advance their position on the ground. Peace talks resumed in the beginning of December, but the North Vietnamese returned to their original unyielding stance. And before the year was out, the talks had collapsed. In response, President Nixon sent the North Vietnamese an ultimatum return to the negotiation table, or bombing would begin again in earnest. The North Vietnamese chose not to reply. Nixon's response was quick and decisive. On December 18, 1972, field commanders received the order that began the Linebacker II campaign. Quote, you are directed to commence a maximum effort, repeat, maximum effort of B-52 strikes in the Hanoi Haiphong areas, unquote. The new campaign would be called Linebacker 2. American planes and pilots are engaged in Linebacker 2, the most massive bombing campaign of the Vietnam War. For the first time ever, unrelenting firepower would be aimed at the heart of North Vietnam, Hanoi. Their only restrictions, civilian areas, religious sites, and POW compounds. While Linebacker II was planned as a three-day maximum effort strike, U.S. airmen were instructed to be prepared to carry on beyond three days, if necessary. All the bets were off uh, in this December campaign. Uh, we went after everything. We bombed all the airfields. Uh, we bombed barracks. We bombed missile sites. We bombed radar sites. Uh, we bombed dock areas. Uh, we bombed everything there was. Uh, we were all bombing downtown. There were, there were no prescribed targets that we couldn't strike. During this operation, U.S. airmen faced an even more daunting task than their predecessors. North Vietnam had improved its MiG fighter force and the skill of its pilots. Hanoi and Haiphong were protected by almost two dozen SAM sites, each of which contained up to six missile launchers, adding up to hundreds of SA-2s. The fighters would uh, come up and try to, to make us jettison our loads or whatever. The, the SAMs were to support the fighters or to shoot us down, and then if they, if they could drive us down into the lower altitudes, then their AAA would come up on us. They were very good. I mean, let's face it, they had quite a long time to perfect their system. We knew that uh, it was going to be a lot of uh, SAM missiles. Uh, we were uh, briefed that we expected MiGs, and we were vulnerable, quite vulnerable. The B-52s hadn't really gone that far north, and 
and experience that heavily defended targets that we were planning to go to. During the 11 days of Linebacker 2, no fewer than 1,300 SAMs were launched at U.S. strike aircraft, making the Hanoi Haiphong area one of the most heavily defended cities in the world at that time. When, when the SAMs would come up through the overcast, you'd see a great big fireball and then little lights pop out through the top as they were coming up. Uh, it was, I, I don't know how else to explain it, it was, it was the best 4th of July I've ever seen in my life in December. The primary strength of Linebacker 2 lay in the more than 200 massive B-52 bombers that flew out of Anderson Air Force Base in Guam and Yu Tapao Air Base in Thailand. B-52's radar-guided bombing systems were immune to weather restrictions, allowing them to bomb accurately even during the worst weather of the monsoon season. Approaching their targets silently at 30,000 feet in the air, the B-52s could hardly be heard from below. For the North Vietnamese, the first sign of a B-52 attack was often the impact of bombs falling down around them. Depending on which base the B-52 mission launched from, crews faced a variety of hardships. If they left from Guam, just getting to the action took almost 12 hours and required multiple refuelings. While the flights from Thailand were much shorter, they were more frequent, placing the crew in harm's way more often. Also, many crews had never flown in combat before, making the missions even more stressful. We hadn't uh, uh, really gone to what we call combat, uh, where the pressurization changed. And the voices change from a uh, normal voice to a very low uh, pitched, and you really had to know the individuals in the aircraft to know their voices to be able to, uh, to know who was talking. And that was one of the things that we weren't sure what was going to, what was going to happen when we did actually go. On December 18th, the first night of Linebacker 2, 129 B-52s and 15 F-111s departed in three waves for seven targets in the Hanoi Target Complex. The B-52s employed many of the same tactics that had been used throughout Rolling Thunder. The bombers approached Hanoi in streams, cells of three following cells of three at roughly the same heading and altitude. At the same time, orders were given not to make any evasive maneuvers so as to preserve the electronic countermeasure protection of the cell formation. As a result, B-52 bomber crews were sitting ducks for the deadly North Vietnamese SAM arsenal. I'm sitting back there trying to to jam the radars and try to, to uh, deter their, their tracking capability and also trying to see where the missiles are and we didn't have the, uh, the luxury of keeping being able to maneuver away from as much as the fighters could and so it was a new experience for us having so many missiles shot at us at one time. During the three-wave attack, no fewer than 200 SAMs were fired at the approaching B-52s, destroying three of the giant bombers. Following the tragic losses of day one, tactics were altered to allow evasive maneuvers while traveling in and out of the combat zone. Time separation between cells was also increased to four minutes, allowing each cell additional room to maneuver. They lost aircraft the first night, and so the threat uh, briefing was very intense, and uh, we expected to lose people uh, just because of the number of missiles that were fired and um, the number of us going up there. The attrition was going to be significant because we were going up in numbers, that somebody was going to get hit, so we didn't know what was going to happen. 
The changes paid off. No B-52s were lost on the second night. But U.S. forces soon discovered that while their crews were learning more with each mission, so too were the North Vietnamese. A fact made more clear on the third night of Linebacker 2. The first wave to fly that night was made up of 33 B-52s. Six of the bombers successfully targeted the Gialam train repair yard outside of Hanoi. The rest of the crews were not as fortunate. The remaining B-52s encountered intense samfire as they struck the Yen Vien rail yard. No less than 130 missiles were launched at the remaining aircraft. The North Vietnamese downed three of the big birds. The second wave of the evening returned without a loss, but the third wave again encountered tremendous resistance. Three more B-52s were lost to SA-2 missiles, all of which were hit while making their post-target turn. One of the most impressive things that I saw in Vietnam was a B-52 get hit in the belly by a SAM and to spiral down through the clouds. It lit up the, the whole sky because there were a couple of stratus cloud layers uh, at, at altitude. And the 52 actually got hit above one of those layers. So it was like a big uh, neon light up above the clouds, lighting up the clouds. And then as it spun through the layers of clouds, you could see the, the, the aircraft burning, illuminated by its own, its own flame. A total of nine B-52s were lost on the first three nights of Linebacker 2, with the heaviest losses coming on the last night. While Linebacker 2 did not come as a surprise to the North Vietnamese, the intensity of the attacks was more than they had anticipated. Even so, the North Vietnamese learned quickly that the B-52s had an Achilles heel. The giant planes were equipped with electronic countermeasure pods designed to jam North Vietnamese SAM and anti-aircraft radars. When the bombers were flown in close formation, the entire cell was protected by an electronic shield. But if the formation was broken, the shield was weakened significantly. What we were supposed to do was supposed to do gentle, gentle maneuvers and uh, much more effective. And the idea was that everybody stays together. If you have somebody do an evasive maneuver, he breaks away and now you have three separate targets. It, you isolate yourself. You, you lose the, what's called mutual protection of the jamming from the aircraft together. The ECM shield reached its weakest point during the post-target turn, immediately following the bomb drop. The maneuver rendered the B-52's ECM equipment useless, leaving the planes electronically unprotected. To make matters worse, only half of the G-model B-52's had been outfitted with the latest ECM pods, which afforded substantially better protection. This, coupled with multiple inoperative ECM transmitters, proved to be both costly and fatal. While equipment problems contributed to B-52 losses, the greatest factor was still tactical. The previous three or four nights, whenever we had taken the, the heavy losses in B-52s, they had come in what was called same day, same way. You'd, you'd come in in a long string of maybe six or eight, nine, ten airplanes and it would be real easy for the, for the guys with the SAM sites to uh, calibrate their, their, their missiles. Frustrated by mounting losses, many crews began to press commanders for tactical changes based on experience gained in combat. We were getting hit pretty hard, so uh, we were asking for some changes. We would like to be able to um, do some other tactics that hadn't been allowed for. We also said we'd like to go straight out uh, to the ocean, at least if you hit, you're, you're coasting out to friendly territory. And I think that we got about 75% of what we asked for. 
B-52 crews planned their missions with great care in an attempt to minimize risk and maximize the efficiency of the strike force. The tactics developed by the crews offered greater protection. They would enter the target area at different headings and actually cross each other's flight path. Furthermore, cells would fly at different altitudes. One wave was coming, going east to west, and the other wave was going west to east. And I was hope that we were on top of the other wave, <laughs> not underneath. Finally, they decreased the angle of bank during the post-target turn, reducing the deadly loss of electronic protection. Now, their only choice was to test the new tactics on the battlefield and hope that they proved effective. While the B-52s were the muscle of the Linebacker II campaign, the massive bombers received extensive support from a vast array of naval and Air Force air power. Perhaps the most potent and effective support came from the crews of Air Force F-111s. In a major coordinated strike like Linebacker II was, uh, the B-52s were the, the strong point. Everything else was in support of that. And uh, the F-111s, what we did during that time was bomb airfields and keep the MiGs down so they couldn't get up and uh, harass the B-52s. The General Dynamics F-111 suffered a disastrous initial deployment in 1968. Several F-111s were lost due to failures in the aircraft's terrain-following navigation system. With the kinks ironed out, an improved F-111 returned to combat with a vengeance as a nighttime all-weather bomber. Within 33 hours of deployment from their home at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, some 50 F-111s were fully operational for linebacker strikes. Their crews eager to prove themselves and the advanced capabilities of their aircraft. Uh, we're flying at 200 feet at very high speeds at night and in the weather. It was still, to a qualified crew member, a guy that had trained in that airplane, it was the safest way to go. I'd rather go in a battle in that airplane than any other airplane I've ever flown. The F-111 was put into action that took full advantage of its impressive ordnance load, superior navigation system, and all-weather capability. Flying fast and low, her crews were able to successfully strike some of North Vietnam's most heavily defended targets, including MiG bases, airfields, and later in the campaign, SAM missile sites. Flying at such a low altitude would seem to pose tremendous risk to these airmen. But speed, combined with the low-level night capability, made the 111 invisible to North Vietnamese gunners. Unable to find a target to guide on, rendered the SAMs virtually useless, even over the formidably defended Hanoi and Haiphong. There was an airfield not too far to the northeast from Hanoi that I hit one night about three in the morning. Unfortunately, one of our other troops had hit it uh, just a little while before and woke them all up and got them mad. There was firepower galore stuff coming up all over. I, I never saw so much in my life. And, and the most spectacular uh, was a quad 37. These are four 37 millimeter um, guns mounted together. And the uh, tracers formed just about a solid uh, red beam of light, four beams uh, that uh, lasted a long ways. In fact, uh, those four beams went over my nose and I can, I can picture that right now, all that stuff coming up and, and these, these red beams going right across my nose. And I still marvel that uh, nothing hit me. 
The newly renovated jet was also equipped with electronic countermeasures to jam enemy radar. However, the crews rarely employed them, fearing that the ECMs would highlight rather than hide them. Instead, they stuck to old-fashioned flying maneuvers. When the bombs came off, you, you could see the flash of the bombs hitting the ground because you're only at a couple hundred feet when you release the bombs. And the flash would light up your airplane just like the flash from a flash camera. So you immediately did a left bank, let's say, when the flash went off, and then immediately reverse it because then they fire in the direction of where they saw you from the flash because it would blind them as well as you. Initially, the F-111 bombers made pre-strikes against air bases in order to prevent MiGs from making it into the air. Towards the end of Linebacker 2, the F-111's primary role became nighttime strikes against SAM sites that would otherwise have been aimed against the B-52s. Okay, that's good. Yeah. And we're in target, I'm picking up. Uh, the SAC people loved us. Uh, we diverted a lot of the firepower of the North Vietnamese uh, against us, and we went after their, their SAM sites and uh, blew the hell out of a few of them that would have been shooting missiles at their B-52s. In fact, SAC at one point said that they weren't going in unless the F-111s were going in, so I don't think that was probably true, but it made us feel good anyway. The U.S. Strategic Air Command believed that North Vietnamese MiGs would be the greatest threat to the B-52 strike force during Linebacker II. As a result, over half of the Air Force F-4 Phantoms were dedicated to patrolling for MiGs, the idea being to kill before being killed. Fortunately, the threat was vastly diminished by the end of the campaign compared with the previous air strategy, Rolling Thunder. While it was a relief not to face off with enemy planes, it was also draining. Patrol missions became long stretches of flying, rarely disrupted by the thrill of a dogfight. Uh, if we didn't expend, if we went up there and uh, we didn't blow our tanks, then what we would do is we'd go back out refuel and go up with the next strike force. And if we, again we didn't expend, we'd go back out, refuel and go in with the, the final. They had three waves that night. So I took off about midnight and I was landing at 7.30 in the morning. With the MiG threat out of the way, crews still faced a deadly opponent. B-52s were particularly vulnerable to SAMs. Over 100 SAM missile launchers surrounded Hanoi and Haiphong. Most SAMs were electronically guided by highly skilled radar operators, while others were ballistically launched in hopes of a lucky strike. The giant B-52s were equipped with their own ECM protection, but the sheer number of SAMs in the sky renewed the need for the Wild Weasels, specially equipped F-105s designed to find and destroy SAM sites. The role of the Wild Weasels changed little from the days of Rolling Thunder to Linebacker 2. Using upgraded F-105Gs, F-4s, and vastly improved radar homing missiles, Wild Weasel crews resumed the cat and mouse game of SAM suppression that they had begun years earlier. Well, you just protect the airplanes that you're out there to protect. I mean, I had a wave of B-52s coming over my shoulder, and my electronic warfare officer uh, and myself uh, tried to place ourselves between the surface to air missile site and the people we were trying to protect. Even when we ran out of missiles, we'd turn our to nose towards the uh, an active site and chances are they'd be down. They were not uh, one to argue with a, a weasel pointing its nose at the, at the site. 
At night, B-52s and F-111s dominated the skies. During the day, various Air Force and Navy aircraft carried out strike missions. Initially, the daylight strikes were hampered by bad weather. But once the skies cleared up, strike forces unloaded laser-guided bombs on North Vietnam's power plants. A steady rain of bomb raids pummeled North Vietnamese air defenses almost continually until Christmas. The U.S. was gaining ground. Finally, at midnight on Christmas Eve, after seven days of continuous bombing, President Nixon called a 36-hour ceasefire. U.S. air crews desperately needed a rest. They hoped the ceasefire would be the beginning of the end. Perhaps they had bombed Hanoi back to the negotiating table. For most American crews, the break from constant combat conditions was a welcome change. They needed time to rest their bodies and heal their wounds. The war had been costly. The losses were taking a toll on their morale. In the downtime, confined to their air bases, crews confided in one another. The crucible of combat forged a bond that would never break. Like my crew, I guess all the crews, pretty much the same, you know, made up of six different personalities, six individuals. You know, you're, you're living together for like five months at a time. Um, you're doing everything together. Um, and uh, so it's almost like a family. The family of airmen and their relatives back home were put to the test in this particularly anxious situation. While peace was on the horizon, they still didn't know when or if they'd ever make it home. Every day was the same over there for us, but uh, for the wives back here, uh, who just had to sit and wait. Well, it seemed like uh, every Monday night, uh, somebody got a visitor to let them know that uh, uh, their husband wasn't coming home. There was another objective for linebacker two, to secure the release of the hundreds of U.S. prisoners of war. So many of them were fellow airmen who had been shot down over North Vietnam during rolling thunder. To the men imprisoned on the ground, the sound of bombs raining down all around them was the sound of freedom. It restored their hope that maybe they would make it home alive. Captain John McCain was one of those men, imprisoned for more than five years after being shot down over downtown Hanoi. Perhaps the most spectacular thing I've ever seen in my life was the first uh, night of the B-52 raids. Uh, the entire sky would be lit up when a B-52 would be hit, falling from 30,000 feet with thousands of gallons of fuel on fire, the surfaced air missiles filling the sky. Uh, incredible and just uh, unbelievable and it was also clear to us that, that we were going to get out because Vietnamese simply could not sustain that kind of punishment. I had one POW friend named Ted Gostas and he was held in isolation for the entire time he was captured until the very end when he was released and his isolation stopped all senses except for hearing. And he said, I heard the B-52s coming, and I knew what was going to happen before it even happened. And he could actually hear the whisper of those jets from 30,000 feet, 15 miles away or so, coming toward Hanoi. And he swears this to this day, that he could hear them, and he knew the war was over. While many airmen taking part in Linebacker 2 were grateful for the break in hostilities, Many felt that it did little more than give the North Vietnamese a chance once again to repair and restock their defenses. There were a lot of unhappy crew members when they had that Christmas ceasefire because 
we knew exactly what was going to happen, and it sure did. Attempts at diplomacy failed again. The North Vietnamese decided to gamble with what little they had left. Nothing could have prepared them for what was coming. While American diplomats worked the bargaining table, military planners prepared to unleash the most devastating air attack thus far. Phase three, the final phase of linebacker two, began on the day after Christmas in 1972. The largest single wave of B-52s ever amassed flew to 10 targets in the Hanoi and Haiphong area. They dropped nearly 10,000 bombs in a matter of minutes. Finally, it appeared that the attack might break the North Vietnamese forever. On the ground in Hanoi, it was the POWs who witnessed the fear in their captors' eyes. Well, we heard, uh, of course, uh, the sirens go off. We saw the missiles flying and uh, the sky lighting up, the whole ground shaking as the B-52 bomb loads uh, struck uh, the ground. Uh, they were using our prison as an offset point for their radar uh, bombing. Uh, you know, and it went on for hours and hours and hours all night long, night after night, for about 10 days. And uh, the guards were shook, the guards and the interrogators. You could tell they were frightened. For the first time, they felt the strength of United States air power. Fear didn't paralyze the North Vietnamese SAMs. More than 150 missiles were fired, taking down two B-52s the final B-52 losses of the Vietnam conflict. By the 10th day of bombing, with the SAM threat and anti-aircraft defenses significantly diminished, some began to wonder if more strikes were necessary. They seemed to accomplish the desired goal. Their targets were destroyed. In fact, some airmen suspected that the North Vietnamese had run out of missiles to fire. They launched a lot of missiles in the first three days of uh, 11 days. And then uh, things got pretty quiet. And uh, the rumor was that we had run them out of missiles, which I believe, because they'd launched a ton of missiles. And by Christmas Eve, the mission we flew on Christmas Eve, we hardly heard an electronic beep. And there wasn't a single missile shot and no sign of MiGs. So uh, it was real quiet. We could have been flying over Kansas. On the final day of Linebacker 2, 60 B-52s from both Thailand and Guam flew their final mission against North Vietnam. Only a handful of randomly fired SAMs were launched at the aircraft. Within 24 hours, President Nixon called a halt to bombing north of the 20th parallel. It had taken 1,300 strike sorties and tens of thousands of bombs to get to this point. It had cost the United States dearly in men and machinery. 26 aircraft were downed. Many more airmen were killed or captured. From the B-52 contingent alone, nearly three dozen crew members became POWs. Some were later repatriated. 29 would never return home. Linebacker 2 demonstrated unrelenting military might, but its psychological impact was impossible to calculate. The B-52 bombings shattered the urban centers of Hanoi and Haiphong, and any sense of security in the hearts of its people. The psychological aspect of the B-52s, I think, was uh, uh, in, in literature uh, is proven that it was a tremendous psychological weapon to the ground forces of North Vietnam and, and the Viet Cong. Uh, as far as actually being a tremendous factor in the ending of the war, I think uh, the Christmas bombing uh, 
uh, is a testament to that's exactly what brought the uh, North Vietnamese to the table as quickly as it did. And in my opinion, it's something that should have been done in 1967. Within a month of the campaign, North Vietnam signed a ceasefire agreement in Paris, officially ending American involvement in Vietnam. For the United States, the most important aspect of the agreement was the release of over 600 American prisoners of war, many of whom had spent more than six years in such notorious jails as the Hanoi Hilton. We finally did what we should have done many years ago and many lives ago. We should have done this. We want to get our POWs out of the North. We want to get them back. And we want to get out of Vietnam with honor, so to speak. And uh, we were happy and we thought we had done that. At least in the North, we had done our part of it anyway. The all-out bombing campaign mounted by the crews of B-52s, F-111s, and other support aircraft during the 11 days of Linebacker II managed to achieve what 10 years of bitter conflict had failed to reach, a peace agreement between the United States and North Vietnam. But it was a bittersweet resolution for the many U.S. servicemen who would forever wonder if the war could have ended earlier. December 1972, after nearly a decade of fighting in Vietnam, American forces decided to make one final push for victory. For 11 days and nights, U.S. Navy and Air Force bombers, led by the venerable B-52, flew around-the-clock missions, raining over 15,000 tons of bombs onto North Vietnam. The operation known as Linebacker II, brought the communist war machine to its knees. The men and machines of Linebacker II didn't just fly bombing missions. They ultimately flew America out of the Vietnam War. For four years, the U.S. Air Force and Navy pummeled the North Vietnamese in an intense but limited bombing campaign known as Rolling Thunder. The goal, to stop weapons and supplies flowing from the North to the communist Viet Cong guerrillas in the South and to send a clear message to their North Vietnamese sponsors. For three years, pilots of fighter bombers like the Air Force F-105 Thunder Chief and the Navy's workhorse, the A-4 Skyhawk, constantly bombarded a heavily defended North Vietnam. Air crews routinely braved one of the most formidable anti-aircraft defense networks ever amassed, while at the same time operating under the most restrictive rules of engagement in history. The list of Beano's was at least 10 times longer than the, than the B-sums, okay? There'll be none of this, there'll be no of that, there'll be none of this, there'll be none of that. We couldn't fly over Hanoi. If you went in, you could only fly certain routes. Um, it was asinine. 
you know, you fly by and, and you're unloading boats in Haiphong and you say, oh, well, okay, we'll dodge those later. The list of things you couldn't do was enormous. The restrictions only made U.S. missions more dangerous. While American airmen were able to evade North Vietnamese air defenses, they were hardly made. Until 1971, the air war targeted the main corridor for supplies flowing to communist forces in South Vietnam. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not one road, but a network of paths, streams, and trails that ran 1,500 miles through the mountains between Laos and South Vietnam. It was the lifeline for communist forces in South Vietnam, delivering over 60 tons of supplies daily. In around-the-clock missions, U.S. forces dropped more bombs on the trail than were dropped during the entire Second World War. Sadly, with little effect. Finally, bombing was called off, giving the North Vietnamese further opportunity to increase their strength. Early on, the North Vietnamese weren't much of a threat. Their air defenses were limited to 36 MiG-17s, about 1,500 anti-aircraft guns. Within just a few years, the situation had changed dramatically. The North Vietnamese Air Force was equipped with nearly 250 MiGs, many of which were MiG-21s, the Soviet Union's latest fighter. Also, they had developed an extensive and well-coordinated ground-based defense network. Their new defenses included hundreds of radar-controlled anti-aircraft guns and SA-2s, Soviet surface-to-air missiles that could travel at Mach 3 up to 60,000 feet. Now it was clear that North Vietnamese forces were becoming steadily more aggressive, moving its forces further into southern North Vietnam and Laos. To stop the offensive, the United States built a noose of air assets throughout the region. The Navy positioned planes and pilots everywhere. Carrier fleets were reinforced. Hundreds of Air Force F-4 Phantoms and B-52s, plus additional support aircraft, were positioned at bases in South Vietnam, Thailand, and Guam. Despite ongoing peace talks between Hanoi and Washington, on March 29, 1972, North Vietnamese forces mounted a large-scale ground invasion into South Vietnam. The invasion caught the unsupported and poorly prepared South Vietnamese forces completely off guard. In response, President Richard Nixon launched Operation Freedom Train, a massive bombing campaign against southern North Vietnam in an attempt to halt the flow of men and supplies heading southward. By early May, an angered President Nixon called on the full force of U.S. air power expanding Freedom Train into an unrestricted attack on targets throughout all of North Vietnam. The first linebacker campaign had begun. Unlike Rolling Thunder, during linebacker, the Nixon administration allowed military commanders the freedom to throw around the full weight of their forces. Rules of engagement were relaxed. Pilots no longer needed permission to hit targets that had previously been considered politically sensitive. The primary weapons of the new campaign were also dramatically different than those employed during Rolling Thunder. One of the most significant changes was the addition of laser-guided smart bombs. They were carried by fighter bombers like the F-4 Phantom and big bombers like the B-52. That is where the laser-guided weapons had the greatest impact. The extraordinary accuracy of the new bombs and the B-52's internal targeting system allowed strike forces to accurately hit sites that were close to religious buildings, civilian areas, and POW compounds.
strike forces bombed oil and fuel storage sites, air bases, seaports, communications lines, and rail yards, targets that they had been waiting and wanting to strike for years. The intensity of the American bombing campaign forced North Vietnam back to the negotiating table. On October 8th, North Vietnam accepted nearly all U.S. proposals for peace. By late October, it appeared imminent that a peace accord would be signed in Paris. On October 27, 1972, a bombing halt was once again placed on targets above the 20th parallel, ending the first linebacker campaign. As had happened in the past, the North Vietnamese interpreted the bombing halt as a sign of weakness and took the opportunity to advance their position on the ground. Peace talks resumed in the beginning of December, but the North Vietnamese returned to their original unyielding stance. And before the year was out, the talks had collapsed. In response, President Nixon sent the North Vietnamese an ultimatum return to the negotiation table, or bombing would begin again in earnest. The North Vietnamese chose not to reply. Nixon's response was quick and decisive. On December 18, 1972, field commanders received the order that began the Linebacker II campaign. Quote, you are directed to commence a maximum effort, repeat, maximum effort of B-52 strikes in the Hanoi Haiphong areas, unquote. The new campaign would be called Linebacker 2. American planes and pilots are engaged in Linebacker 2, the most massive bombing campaign of the Vietnam War. For the first time ever, unrelenting firepower would be aimed at the heart of North Vietnam, Hanoi. Their only restrictions, civilian areas, religious sites, and POW compounds. While Linebacker II was planned as a three-day maximum effort strike, U.S. airmen were instructed to be prepared to carry on beyond three days, if necessary. All the bets were off uh, in this December campaign. Uh, we went after everything. We bombed all the airfields. Uh, we bombed barracks. We bombed missile sites. We bombed radar sites. Uh, we bombed dock areas. Uh, we bombed everything there was. Uh, we were all bombing downtown. There were, there were no prescribed targets that we couldn't strike. During this operation, U.S. airmen faced an even more daunting task than their predecessors. North Vietnam had improved its MiG fighter force and the skill of its pilots. Hanoi and Haiphong were protected by almost two dozen SAM sites, each of which contained up to six missile launchers, adding up to hundreds of SA-2s. The fighters would uh, come up and try to, to make us jettison our loads or whatever. The, the SAMs were to support the fighters or to shoot us down, and then if they, if they could drive us down into the lower altitudes, then their AAA would come up on us. They were very good. I mean, let's face it, they had quite a long time to, to perfect their system. We knew that uh, it was going to be a lot of uh, SAM missiles. Uh, we were uh, briefed that we expected MiGs, and we were vulnerable, quite vulnerable. The B-52s hadn't really gone that far north and um, hadn't experienced that heavily defended targets that we were making a dent in the man and material going to support the Viet Cong. Bombing restrictions might have been scoring points in the political arena, but it was ultimately costing America and its allies victory on the battlefield. Rolling Thunder is a hell of a good idea. It just never was applied rationally. We'd start it, we'd stop it, we'd start it, we'd stop it. Every time it looked like we were doing some good, then we'd go into another bombing halt so you could repair everything we'd hit. Uh, and there was no continuity. You know, we didn't take out all the bridges in one area. We didn't take out all the anything in one area. We'd jump over and hit that, jump over and hit that, jump over and hit that. 
Finally, with negative reports dribbling in from the front, President Lyndon Johnson decided to halt bombing operations above the 19th parallel. Rolling Thunder was over. U.S. forces began a steady withdrawal from bases in South Vietnam and Thailand. The Air Force withdrew more than 400 aircraft, while the Navy reduced its number of carriers offshore by half. The situation was grim. The ground war in South Vietnam was heating up. Hundreds of U.S. airmen shot down during Rolling Thunder were being held as prisoners of war in various North Vietnamese compounds. Many of the downed pilots were from B-52 crews. In an unprecedented move, B-52s, the lumbering bomber, had become the plane of choice for close air support of ground troops throughout Rolling Thunder. Meanwhile, smaller, lighter bombers, typically better suited for the low altitude ground bombing missions, flew defensive missions against the North Vietnamese. The switch in roles was unusual for U.S. troops in Southeast Asia. Many questioned the decision. Ultimately, though, the B-52's firepower went unmatched against the rather primitive defenses of the Viet Cong. The controversial decision to use the giant bomber won some support when many ground troops credited it with saving their lives. A big strategic bomber for close air support is surprising, but that's how we used the airplane in those days. Um, we're talking about uh, dropping bombs within hundreds of meters of, of friendly forces, and uh, it worked.